is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered those things, these things, and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they uh, constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us by giving us your son to die on the cross. Jesus, we thank you for this time that we remember your loving sacrifice, that it was the joy that you had to save sinners, people who are your enemies. And while we were yet sinners, you came and you died on the cross for us. But, oh, Jesus, we know that you're alive. We know that you fulfilled and you paid the price and you resurrected because there was no sin in you. That you who knew no sin became sin, but not sinful. And that's why you, death could not take a hold of you. And so we thank you that you're alive and that you had the victory and you resurrected but we thank you, you didn't resurrect alone, but you resurrected us with you. And Lord, you also ascended to heaven. And thank you, you didn't ascend to heaven alone, but you've also seated us with you in the heavenlies. So Lord, we thank you that you're alive. And as we sang in that song, that you're alive and you came to heal our broken life. So we come to you right now, O oh Jesus, with our broken life, desiring that you come with the power of your resurrection that you would heal us and that you would fix us, that you would give us perspective, that you would help us to see things in your way. Oh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would minister to our hearts, that you would move in our midst and turn our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, where you can use the word, the living, powerful word, to penetrate in our hearts, that we may that we may be convicted, confess our sins, and look more and more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Luke 24, amazing chapter. You know, I, I, I like to call this chapter the opening. Lots of openings happen in this chapter. 
And what's really on my heart is the two disciples that were on their way to the road, on their way to the city of Emmaus. And uh, it's really like, it's quite like, it's inappropriate behavior at the time of the resurrection. Very inappropriate behavior at the time of the resurrection. But I'm going to try my best to zip through the whole chapter and focus a little bit more on the two disciples of Emmaus. And then I'd like to share about seven things that were opened in this chapter. And I think if these seven things are open in our lives through that power of the resurrection of Jesus, wow, what would, what would happen to our life? We'd be transformed. We'd be totally different. But let's start from the beginning. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So here, these women prepared spices. What are they going to do with the spices? What? What did you say? Spice Jesus? <laughs> um, thank you for using the word in a sentence. That's what I do a lot of times. It doesn't come out right every time. But <laughs> what are you saying? Out of honor, respect, and that's what you do to the body, right? It's like, do you do it to what kind of body that you, <laughs> you don't spice up the body, but you put spices on the body? What, do you, which, what kind of body do you do it on? A dead one. You wouldn't come to me and put spices on me. Be like, I'd be very offended. What are you like, pronouncing me dead? I'm alive. I'm breathing, okay? The only person, what spices actually touched came on Jesus? Huh? There's, there, are there any spices that went specifically for his burial or no? Huh? What? Myrrh? What do you mean myrrh? Like, you talk about the, the wise men? No. No, spices that went for burial. They, is it specific? Did anyone make it or no one made it? He resurrected too fast. Huh? They were going to put it, but did they put it? No. Has there been any spices that went on Jesus specifically for his burial? Thank you. The woman. The woman, a lot of people think that woman is Mary. And he says that this, this lady, he, she's the only one that puts spices on him. He says, for my burial. That's he said it. No one else said it. There was, she's not the only one that anointed him, right? Remember that sinner woman that came in Simon's house, Simon the Pharisee? And she went and anointed him. That wasn't for his burial. That was for his honor, to honor him. But she did it for his, to, to honor him for his burial. And then for that one, she's the only one that Jesus says what? This will be a remembrance for her forever. Three things Jesus told us to remember forever. And that's the first one is Lot's wife. Second one is communion. He told us, do this in remembrance of me. And he says, remember Lot's wife. And then that lady, Mary, a lot of people think she's Mary. And Mary, that she's the one that did that and anointed him. But here are these women too late. They're going to meet a dead Jesus. The only one that caught him, caught him when he was alive. And bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. So they were going, they were pleasantly surprised that there was this huge stone there. And if you read in the Gospel of Mark, it says that it was a very large stone in Mark 16, I believe, verse 4 or so. And it happened as they were greatly, uh, then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Well, they're like, okay, it's a pleasant surprise. Let's go in there. Let's put these spices. Let's honor this, this, this amazing teacher that came, this amazing prophet, this amazing uh, 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 leader that we had. And then they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus there. And it happened. As they were greatly perplexed about this, they're like, oh, what just happened here? Where did he go? Who could have taken him? Who would take up that body? That behold, two men stood by, stood by them in shining Garments. So here it describes them, like the pastor shared in the morning, that the, the two, the two uh, that came with Mary Magdalene, it says two angels. Here it says two men, but they were wearing shiny garments. That's the description they were described with. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth. So here their faces are what? Bow to the earth. That's an inappropriate behavior at the resurrection. Would you, you agree? If you know that Jesus resurrected, obviously they don't know yet, but if you know that Jesus resurrected and your face is bowed to the earth, what is, what is that saying when someone's faith, face is bowed to the earth? Sorrowful, right? Is that a thing to be when Jesus, when you find out like, hey, that person that's dead is alive? 
I'm talking Jesus to you, and you're going to visit him to put spices on him, okay? That would be not, it's an inappropriate behavior to be sad like that, to have your face to the ground and to the earth. They said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why? Why do you seek the living among the dead? This is a question posed by the angels, these two men that are wearing shiny garments. They said, why do you seek the living among the dead? And that's really a question. I don't want to pause too much on it because that's not really what's on my heart. But a lot of times we seek the living among the dead. A lot of times we don't know the power of Jesus in our life and Him to be able to fulfill what he, His promises to us, for Him to be able to take us through, to give us victory or whatever it is. We feel that and then we go and follow dead things. Yet we don't follow Jesus and follow Him in the right way. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. Guys, remember. And they reminded them. They're like, it's not like some weird news to you that he said this to you. Remember it. Remember what he said to you when he was in Galilee. Saying, the Son of Man, and here's a quote of Jesus. They're quoting him. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Remember, he's supposed to rise again. And they remembered his words. So they got it. The women remember the words. Like, yeah, that's right. He said it. Well, there's an empty tomb. We don't see Jesus, but we believe it. And they went and they told the disciples. Then there's this pause. Then, uh, uh, sorry, and then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. The eleven is a term that's used for the disciples. Why not the twelve? Because one is dead. Judas is dead. And so they told the eleven and all the rest. So they told everyone that they can tell about the, the resurrection or the, the news that they got from these two angels. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. So there was a group of women that had gone there, and they're the ones that had done this, and they said this to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Idle tales is nonsense. They're like, that's some nonsense. Wow. And they did not believe them. Now, the, the, not the two women, the women, these, this group of women, when they went to the tomb, they heard the news. Did they actually see Jesus? No. Did they see an empty tomb? Yes. Did they believe the angels? Yes. And then they went and told these top men, these top guys, and they looked at them and they said, what? Nonsense. These words to them were nonsense. Man, it's amazing. I wonder if God says something ridiculous to us. Do we believe him? Or do we say, that's nonsense, Lord. Lord, it is not possible. You know, um, I'll tell you the most ridiculous thing I, that ever happened, in my opinion, in the Bible. And that's for what the angel told Mary. He says, you shall conceive. She's like, <laughs> Lord, I don't know a man. I don't know a man. I don't have physical relationship with a man. How can this be? And he's like, God is able, basically. And then it says, and she believed. He, she said, let it be to me as you say. See, that's, there's some people that put us to shame. They believe like crazy things, but they believe it. And God does it. And then God is glorified. And then there, well, a lot of times there's, maybe not you guys, but me. And, and some of us were like, yeah, illogical, crazy. This can't happen, impossible. But God of impossibility, he's the God of the resurrection. Seriously, Jesus resurrect? Come on. But he did. He resurrected. He promised that he would resurrect and he, and it happened. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. And Peter's like, well, I got to go see. I got to go see what happened. And we see that race that happened between Peter and John that the pastor spoke to us about this morning. He goes over there, he sees, and he's like, scratching his head. Still didn't believe. Didn't believe. 
didn't believe, but he's like, well, uh, they say that he resurrected, or they say from someone that they heard that he resurrected, they didn't see him resurrect, but yet there's an empty tomb, but I'm perplexed. I don't know, what could this be? And we do this a lot. We complicate things. We make it so like, we fill it with unnecessary baggage, man. Whatever God wants to do in our life, it's just simple. It's simple. It's simple. I tell you guys this story that, um, that I shared multiple times, and I don't know where I heard it from, and I'm sure you guys have heard it from someone else in a different version. It comes in different versions, okay? I like the one I make up at the, the moment whenever I'm, you know, so this guy, Lord, please speak to me. Lord, please. And so a flood happens. And then, just in case you hear, you hear it mentioned somewhere else, if you're ever listening me, to me saying it and it sounds different, I'm making it up each time, okay? It's just the same gist, all right? So, because uh, I don't remember exactly. So he goes, hey, please save me. Talk to me. So the flood comes, and then he's like, Lord, save me. I want to know that you're going to save me. So there was a warning in the city. Hey, get out of here. There's a flood. He's like, no, no. I'm going to wait for the Lord to save me. So he waits. The flood comes up and starts you know, people now are in boats coming in the, in the city. You're like, hey, jump over. The Lord will save me. Buddy, you're crazy. You're going to drown. He's like, the Lord will save me. Lord, save me. And then, he you knows coming, it's like bubbling, 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 and then going, rising, rising. So he goes on top of his roof. And then a helicopter comes. like, hey, buddy, come down. He's like, no, no, the Lord will save me. And then he dies. And he goes to heaven, talks to the Lord. He's really upset. Like, how, Lord? How is it? How is it that you don't... He didn't hear my prayer. He's like, I heard your prayer. I gave you a warning. I gave you people on a boat. I gave you people in a helicopter. I, s I answered your prayer. A lot of times answering prayer, and we're going to see here how the Lord meets and opens some things through common things. But we want these wows and the bigs, and we hear all these things sometimes on TV, and like someone went, and there was this miracle, and God can do miracles. He can do amazing things. But he can do subtle things that are so amazing in your life and my life. We just complicate it. We're like, no, he didn't speak. No, what if, what if? Just... Hear him out. Listen to him. Let's not be people full of baggage and so complicated. You know, have you ever met someone that's just so complicated? You say anything, it's taken the wrong way no matter what. It's like, seriously, how could you take this one wrong? It's like, you can't go wrong, but they take it wrong. There's people complex like that. And we sometimes are those people. And God says, don't be complex like that. Just listen to my simple heart, my heart to yours, and let me share with you. Now behold, two of them. We're traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So they're going to this place. There's two guys, and then they're traveling to Jerusalem. I'm from Jerusalem to this place called Emmaus, and it's about seven miles away. So how long would that take? It depends. You know, if you get on a treadmill, if you go four miles per hour, it takes you a little less than two hours. It's hard to walk for two hours straight at, at the pace of four and especially if you're conversing with the person and talking, having like a heated conversation, you're going to see their conversation. So say they're going three miles an hour, a little over two hours that they took in this, in this pass as they're, as they're walking. But there was, it probably took a little longer than that because I think they stopped and talked a few times. Um, so these two men are going to Emmaus. That's an inappropriate behavior in the resurrection. Why? Did these people, as we're going to see later on, verse 22 and 23, these people found out, found out that that Jesus, that the tomb is empty or not? Did they know before they leave to Emmaus or not? Yes, they did. Okay, and then these women came and they said they saw angels or image of angels that said that Jesus resurrected. And so they heard some news that Jesus resurrected. And then not only did the women, who their testimony seems to be so unimportant to people, the women shared this and it was nonsense so they sent the top guy. They sent Peter. They sent people over there, and the people went. Did they confirm that the tomb is empty or not? The tomb is empty. They know all of this stuff. They heard all of this stuff, and then what did they decide to do? Let's go to Emmaus. It's just same old business. It's the same mundane routine. And we do this a lot. That God is trying to capture our attention. Hey, could these women be right? Could it be that I'm alive? Could it be that I'm trying to reach your heart? Could it be that I'm really trying to talk to you and you keep ignoring me? 
Could it be that I keep trying to talk to you, but all you say is, I just got business to do later, Lord. When I have time, I will sit with you. When I have time, I will open my ears to hear what you have to say to me. Lord, not now. Lord, I am busy. Lord, I have a meeting with this other disciple. We are disciples. We are believers. It's not like I'm meeting someone who's an unbeliever. Lord, we got to do this thing. Lord, Lord, Lord. And he goes on this shelf, yet he's resurrected. And he wants to show himself to us. How many times has God tried to speak to us? And we wake up in the morning and he starts to open. And they're like, <gasps> and then we're gone. And we never come back to that place where he met us. We never pause and say, you know what, I'm going to reprioritize. Maybe I could delay something. And just wait, wait there and sit quietly and hear him speak to me. Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. I wonder how many of us have this inappropriate behavior in our walk with God today. It comes in different ways. How many of us? Just whatever. Meeting God, <laughs> it's the thing we do, man. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if you were to, to go any church, go to any church in America and point a camera, pointing down. You know, the things that would stumble people People would be stumbled to watch what happens in churches and the behavior of people as they are in the presence of God, supposedly, and they wouldn't miss it. Easter Sunday, no way, man. But the things, man, you'd find people, the one on Facebook, the one texting, the one next to them were across from them, the one kind of... And the one doing this and the one doing that and... You know, some, some people, my, some preachers or singers or worship leaders may be offended with that. They shouldn't. But I think God would be offended. Because you see, people, when they come, they're not in the presence of a preacher. They're not in the presence of a worship team. They're in the presence of God. The worship team is here to praise the Lord and worship and help us worship God with them and enter into his presence and enjoy fellowship and worshiping him. Preachers are mere, just a voice of God to speak what God tells them. They shouldn't be offended. There's nothing offensive about it to them. They're not, you know, I love the Samuel got offended. He really got offended when they asked for a king. He's like, that's offensive. And he's like, oh. you know, and he was like, but he's doing that with God. And God goes and says, Samuel, 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 they did not reject you. They rejected me. I wonder how many of us, our business, our stuff, our status, our social, our baggage, so important that we are so inappropriate in our relationship with God. But the funny thing is, I would say 60, if not more percent of people that do these things are clueless. They think they're very godly people to honor God. But may the Lord do some opening, as we're going to talk about some openings in this message, in this chapter. Seven openings. Seven op Lord, open all seven things. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So first inappropriate thing is they're going about their business as if nothing happened. A lot of times, you know, God talks to us, say, through a song or through someone sharing with us, through a message, through a CD, through, through you know, whatever, internet, whatever. God speaks to us, and then we go out and we let the, wor the world and things flood it out, water it down. That it's, it's nothing. As if we go about our daily business, the same jokes we used to say before, we say it again. The same, the same uh, uh, unclean behavior that we did before, we still do the same thing. So that's what they did. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And they started conversing. And it's a heated conversation. They started talking. And here's like more than once the word talking keeps coming up. They talked together. And they had one subject that they're talking about was what had just happened. What just happened? Jesus died. Jesus is in a tomb. And now 
He's not in the tomb. But there's women that say the angels appeared to them and said that he's resurrected. And then people went and they saw that the tomb and they're trying to like look at all this. It's driving them crazy. It's driving them mad as they're still going about their daily business. And a lot of times that's how we, we, we justify it to ourselves. I'm going about my daily business because I just have to do my daily business. But then I'll talk about Jesus and I'm doing my daily business. But he doesn't have preeminence in my life. He's not number one. That's called justifying my error in my walk with him. So it was while they conversed and reasoned. A lot of words here, talked, conversed, reasoned. This stuff is, is heated and it's driving them crazy. They're trying to figure out what had just happened, what's going on. And they're leaving the place where the action is, where God wants to reveal himself to them. And it says that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Lord Jesus, how amazing are you? Seriously, Lord, if there's two people I would not choose to reveal myself to, if I was you, it would be them. Because it's just, they're so inappropriate. I just would not do it. I couldn't get myself to do it. But he said, you see, I want to open some things. I want him to see me. They're important to me. I want to reveal myself to them. And that's how amazing our Lord is, no matter how inappropriate we are. That, and sometimes we don't even seek Him. We don't even want to, want to be there. I remember one time, the Lord shamed me so much. And it happened, unfortunately, more than once. But I remember one time, it was a Monday night. I was going to Brother Milad's house from Long Beach City College after. So I study there, and then I go there, and then come back and study. So I was going there, and then uh, driving, and I was like, you know, I kind of don't feel like being in a meeting, but I want to be there because that's what I got myself used to. So I was like kind of, I had this weird prayer. I said, Lord, let the meeting be kind of quick, <laughs> especially the message. Let it be really short, and let it be kind of boring and like whatever. I don't, <laughs> I don't really want to hear your voice. <laughs> And I went over there, the most amazing message. The Lord floored me, wowed me with what he spoke to me through that message. And I was like, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? How could I have even said those blasphemous words? And he meets me. I don't want to meet him, but he met me. Here they did not desire to meet him. They weren't looking for him in Emmaus. Hey, let me check him out. Maybe he went, maybe someone carried him to Emmaus. No, they were going about their usual business to Emmaus. And the one that approached, it's not like they saw him like, yo, what's up? Let's talk. No, he came and he approached them. He walked, he came toward them. Oh, how amazing you are, Jesus, that I'm so far from you. My heart is so removed from you. I'm just living everything. I just talk a little bit of Christian lingo. It's one of my Christian people. Maybe when I'm not with them, I don't do that. But when I'm with Christian people, because they're two disciples, I talk Christian lingo. But my heart is far, yet you come and you meet me. So it was while they were conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself, I love the word himself, that means like, ah, it's intentional, drew near, he drew near, we're supposed to draw near to him, he's the one drawing near, drew near and went with them. He started talking, he's just like, he, he's like, they're, I mean, seriously, he's kind of rude. Right? Two people really into a conversation. Someone just kind of like starts walking, comes right in, right in the middle of this conversation and starts talking. That's just rude. That's just, is that normal behavior? But that's how much he loves them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And here he started the conversation. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this? that you have with one another as you walk and are sad. And here in another transition says, they walked and they stood still looking sad. And that's the second inappropriate thing. And the second inappropriate behavior in the resurrection. The first is to just do my thing and forget everything God is trying to share with me and speak to me about. But the second is to be talking a conversation that does nothing to me but makes me sad. What kind of conversation is this 
that you have with one another as you walk and are sad. Now I want to ask really if Jesus was to come into any, jump into any of our conversations, hop into it. You know, like you're actually talking to a human being or other conversations like through the net or whatever, Skype and, you know, all the social whatever things that you guys have out there, whether it's through typing or through writing or... I wonder, would he say, what kind of conversation are you having? I wonder how many of us would be head down, head to the earth, so embarrassed of that. We can't believe the conversation that we're having. And then how many of our conversations actually make the next person sad? And how many of our conversations actually are uplifting and bring people to, to, to just be filled with joy? I mean, I really love... Mary, that she went to visit Elizabeth, and it says, and as Elizabeth heard her voice, she didn't see her. She says that the, 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 the babe leaped with joy in her. So that's the baby excited about the, hearing the voice. How about Elizabeth? It says, and she, Elizabeth, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow, she just heard. There's people like that. <laughs> that you're just like, oh, I just love to be in their presence. There's, you just, they don't even have to talk. They just fill you with, with, with the Spirit of God. And so what kind of conversation is this? I wonder what kind of conversation we have. And I wonder how many conversations bring us sad. But the second thing is, why are we sad when the Lord is alive? Why are we sad when He's doing amazing things in our lives? Then the one whose name was Cleopas. So we know one guy, one of their names is Cleopas. Who's the other one? You know, we don't know for sure. Some people think it's Luke because it's, the name is not mentioned and it's written in the Gospel of Luke. Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Are you like the only person on the planet who hasn't heard this? Do you like not have Facebook, man? Do you like not have, you know, a smartphone? Do you not have, you know, post things? Do you, don't you see the status of everyone? Don't you see whatever? Are you like the only clueless human being on the planet? Are you serious? Are you living in a bubble? That's what, they, that's, what, that's what this means in our day-to-day -day language. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? I love his answer, and he said to them, what things? <laughs> He's awesome. It's not like the things are, he is the things. He's what happened in Jerusalem. And he's asking them what happened. And a lot of times, the Lord wants to hear it from us. He wants to see from us. He wants to say, hey, share with me your heart. I want to see how did you perceive this thing? You know, have you ever told someone something and then they walk out and they do like very different from what you said? You're like, what? That's not what I told you. And it's just their perception. They misunderstood you, right? Has that happened ever? Yeah? No? Maybe? You guys are very eloquent speakers. Well, huh? Yeah, it happens, right? So... That's why he wants to know. He wants to know where they're at. And so like sometimes I'll, um, a lot of my patients, you know, I'll tell them and I'll repeat to them like what to do and like how to do it and whatever. And then I see them and I say, we'll see how this helps you. In a few weeks they come back. It's the same doc. And I say, oh, I'm sorry, we'll try something else. I was like, how was this medicine when you took it? They're like, what? I was supposed to take it? And I'm like, oh, I keep getting balder and balder and my hair keeps getting grayer. And then we have to do it again, and then I repeat it. So now I just say whatever I say, and they say, why don't you repeat it to me? And the things that I hear when they repeat it to me, seriously, it's just funny. And we are like that. He says, what things? He wants to know. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Don't you know, man, this Jesus is amazing. This Jesus, he, is, um, he was a prophet. He's not just a prophet, he's mighty. Mighty in what? Mighty in two things, deed and word. He wasn't just talk, talk, talk. He actually did action and then did the talk. He's mighty in deed and word. And he does that and everyone knows it, especially first God before God and all the people. Everyone knows. It. No exception. How about the Pharisees and them? Do they know it or not? Yes, they do. You guys remember John chapter 3, Nicodemus, he says, for we, he's one of their leaders, he says, we know that you're from God because no one that comes as regular, you know, would do the things that you do. They knew, but they just don't want. They want their own power, their own authority. They don't want to change. 
and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucify him. He's so amazing. Yet our leaders killed him. They crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. This statement is a statement of disappointment or no? Yes. They're like, we thought he was, he's so amazing. He was so big in our eyes. They wanted to kill him and they killed him. And actually it's three days. Today is the third day that he's still, and we're so disappointed. We thought he was the one, but it can't be. Three days. Three days. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. And there's these women, they got there early, and they made us very perplexed. They confused us. They astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. So do you see what, how they worded it here? They said that they went, they didn't find his body, and so when they did not find his body, they came saying, so that's what they're saying, that means they don't believe them, that they had seen, they had also seen a vision, it wasn't a vision, it was a real thing, a vision of angels who said he was alive. So what are they saying? They say, when they didn't find him, they hallucinated. That's what they're saying, right? Am I wrong or not? No, seriously. Can you tell me this? How easy would it be for, was it one woman that went there in the Gospel of Luke? Or how many? More, right? Four or whatever. It says, I think there was more. Maybe more women. Well, anyways, it's not our topic. More than one. How easy would it be to have, let's say, three. Let's take a safe number, three. Three women... Be there, awake, and all three of them hallucinate the same thing. That's crazy, right? It's just, it, it's a lot easier to believe them than to say they're hallucinating, right? I mean, one of the, if you read the gospel, uh, if, not gospel, the First Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15 is the proof that Jesus resurrected, because a lot of people say he didn't resurrect. Some people say he didn't even, wasn't crucified. And so, in 1 Corinthians 15, one of the things, one of the proofs, there's a lot of them, but one of the proofs is the eyewitnesses. And he says that at one time, to prove it, at one time more than 500, I believe, more than 500 believers saw him at the same time. And what is the proof? It's like it's impossible for 500 people to hallucinate because some people say it was a hallucination. You just felt it. You were so sad that you hallucinated. He's like, no, it wasn't. You can't hallucinate like this. So three people, three women, or not three, but three or at least three, if not more, were... Um, we're there. And so to them, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, they perplexed us. They astonished us. When they did not see his body, they, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. Exactly. Everything they said it was like right there, man. But him, they did not see. So what happened? We went about our business to come to Emmaus. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Seriously, you know, would we continue the walk and the conversation with Jesus if this had happened? Imagine, he started it nicely, right? He comes in and we were kind of like, me and this other person are really busy talking. He says, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? That sounds like someone who cares and it's like nice. And then they, we say this whole big thing. And then he comes, he says, first answer he gives us after that. Oh, foolish ones. He's like, what <clears throat> talking to me he's like get out <laughs> you know you see the road is big go over there but he the, oh foolish ones and slow of heart no no you know it's ain't no slow of heart to me but that but that's really the fact a lot of times we're so foolish we're so foolish in how big we make things we're so foolish in our unbelief and our slowness of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. The problem is that these people have been brainwashed. 
Over the years, time after time, week after week at the temple, they've been brainwashed that the Messiah is going to come. He's going to be like on this horse. He's going to come and conquer and beat everyone up. That's not what the scriptures say. Read, read Psalm 22. Read Psalm 69. Those are talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and His resurrection. There is a suffering and then there is glory. It's mentioned more than once, many times. Isaiah 53. The pastor took us through it on Friday night. Many things that speak about that, but they don't get it. They don't, they don't explain that to anyone, so they've been brainwashed. They've been brainwashed about what's right and what's wrong. And a lot of us today, there's brainwashing in churches. There's brainwashing in media. There's brainwashing of things. There's, pe- there's things that I ask people, and they're like, what? Really? That's wrong? Seriously? We don't know some of the things. The, the, some people are just clueless. I pray that we come in contact with His Word, that we understand what He says so that we are not brainwashed, so that we are not slow to believe, that we are not foolish ones. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. All of them spoke about this. And He says, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? This is the way it's always been. This is the way that it's been written about and beginning at Moses. He went way in the beginning. And all the prophets, he expounded or explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I tell you, if there's one Bible study that someone could ask me, you can attend. And we can give you some back to the future thingamajig. There's just one Bible study that I wish I could be there. It's that Bible study. Preachers know nothing. But Jesus explaining from all the Old Testament things concerning himself. Oh, that Bible study. Oh, how I wish, uh, how long would that take? I don't care, man. I would cancel out calling sick every day. (laughs) That is an amazing Bible study that Jesus started explaining to them scriptures concerning himself. And where is this stuff concerning Jesus in the scriptures? Moses and all the prophets everywhere in the Bible talks about Jesus. Have you read the Bible lately? Well, yeah, I did. When? Last week. That's not lately. You missed out on today's meal. Well, I did. So what came out of it? I don't know. It was that one thing that happened, you know, that I don't remember. I don't know what chapter I'm reading. Are you kidding? It's in the Bible. But see, in the Bible, when we read, we need to meet Jesus. If you read the Bible and you don't meet Jesus in the moment you read the Bible, you haven't really read the Bible that time. He expounded to them. He explained to them things in the scriptures, in all the scriptures, all of it, the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther or acted as if he's going further. Wow, Jesus acts. (laughs) That's amazing. Is he lying to them? No, he's being courteous. What's he doing? He's being so courteous that he says, you know what, guys? I don't force myself on you. And I don't force explaining and expounding scriptures to you. I don't force it. But I want you to invite me. I want you to want me. Because I want you. But I want you to want me. And isn't that what the song says? The more I seek him, the more I find him. The more I find him, forget it. You just melt. The more I love him. I want to sit at your feet. Then they drew near to the village. And so he acted like he's going farther. But they constrained him. And basically the word is like, they did this thing where they're like, like just forced him basically. They're like, you just can't leave. Look, it's, it's look. Saying, also, uh, abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. 
They're like, you can't leave. No, no, I, you know, I gotta go. it's not that far. You can't leave. It's just a few more steps. You can't leave. It is dark. And here, what is this? When he started, when he actually explained to them, when he answered them, he said, you are slow of heart. You are foolish ones. But then when he started speaking scripture, something happened to them. There's, we're going to see what happened to them in a minute. Something just happened that made them like so attracted to him. That he's, this man is amazing. The way he speaks about the scripture is amazing that comes out of his mouth. They're like, you're not leaving, okay? And they did it like, you know, like if you ever go into one of those uh, uh, Egyptian, really like true Egyptian, like, like from Egypt type people and you go and, well, other cultures are probably the same, but I know Egypt because I'm, but if you go over there and you are invited for dinner, oh. It's like people are preparing the fatted calf, and it's you, the one invited. You know, and there you're like, okay, like before you even take the first two forks or two whatever, it's like, you know, it's like, hello, let me finish this. And then it was like, they did that to him. Like one held him, you know, here, and one put his hand on the door, like, you're not leaving. It's like, you can't leave. Jesus, no way, man, you're going to have some tea. You're going to have some molochei. <laughs> you're, you're not leaving. You're going to stay here with us. We are not letting you go. And when they did that, and I, oh, he, how he wishes that we would do that with him. Oh, how he wishes that we say, Lord, I don't care. I've got nothing going on. Just don't leave. Just stay. Stay, Lord. Please stay. Far spent. And he went in to stay with them. He was convinced. He's like, these, these guys mean it. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. This is not communion, guys. He's not doing communion. What he's doing here, this is a common meal. A common meal, regular meal that he's eating with them. They said, come eat with us. We want you to stay with us. We insist. We're just not going to let you go. He goes in with them, and he does a common, ordinary thing with them. He eats a common meal, and as he's eating the common meal, but as he eats it, he what he took bread, he blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And that's where a lot of people always, some people, and I like it, they like to pray before they eat. They bless God. They say, Lord, thank you. They give him thanks. Broke and gave it to them. Then, then, at a common meal, their eyes were opened and they knew him. You mean it doesn't have to be supernatural in order for me to see Jesus and know him and recognize him? No. You mean things don't have to get all crazy and be out of whack? No. You mean it, he can come to me in my normal, ordinary, day-to-day -day life? Yes. If you don't believe me, go to, to Kings. Listen to, uh, 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 um, wow, the prophet, um, Elijah, Elijah. Yes, before Elisha. Thank you. Elijah. Elijah went and he's like, oh, there's no one left, just me, Lord. Everyone else, these sellouts. So he went to the Mount of Hor, or Hermon. Anyways, he went to the mountain. Wow, my brain is not working today. So he went to the mountain, the mountain of the Lord. And then he went in a cave. <laughs> what are you doing here, Elijah? No one is following you, just me. You're the only holy person out there, huh? Yep. And then there was a fire. He's like, yeah, God wasn't in it. There was a great storm. Yeah, God not in it. Earthquake, yeah, he's not in it. And then there was a still, small voice. He comes normal, man. It's not the normal thing to be all, oh, yeah. Common meal, but it was then that he opened their eyes and maybe, Maybe what happened was, he's breaking the bread, and he goes like this, and oh, they saw the marks. 
Maybe they saw the marks and they were like, oh, it's you. And they recognized him. They knew him. And he vanished from their sight. Oh, man. Boom, God vanished. He appeared to them in his glorified body. That glorified body is amazing. That glorified body is a real body, flesh and blood that can eat because he ate, but it can also vanish in a second. Vanished. He opened, uh, and then, then their eyes were opened, and then he vanished from their sight. Verse 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? We knew it. We knew it. That's why we held on to him, and we would not let him leave. That's why we, something about him, when he spoke, our heart was burning. There was this fire within. Our heart was burning for him, burn within us while he talked. The more he talked, the more we burned from within. The more he talked, the more we were on fire within us. And then he talked with us on the road, and then he opened the, the scriptures to us. He started opening scripture. Did he actually have a book? I don't think so. He was opening it from his memory, telling them about the word of God, sharing it and opening scripture with them, opening scripture after scripture after scripture, and their heart is burning and burning and burning. I want to ask you a question. When you hear Jesus speak to you, what happens? Eh, you know, not this time, maybe next time. Maybe this, maybe this preacher needs to practice a little bit. <laughs> you know, they have, I've never been to seminary school, so I don't count, I'm not a real, but they have an art to preach stuff it's disgusting honestly <laughs> they're like one preacher I heard him once say it I'm like oh brother he's like you gotta know how to approach the mic so when you go loud you go back like this and you yell and then you go like this and then you're like you know talk like <laughs> what are you doing it's not a movie <laughs> you're just sharing the word of God man happens when we hear his voice not a person's voice you know not your favorite preacher not your favorite singer no his voice through whoever your friend in a normal way in a common meal what happens as you talk and walk on the road and someone is sharing with you scriptures or talking with you about Jesus is there a burning that happens and when the scriptures come, is there an extra burning that happens? Or is it, eh, I heard it before. Say something new. They were burning from within. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Was it late or not? Was it late or not? It was late. It says the day is far spent. It was late. Is it dangerous to leave or not? Yes, it is. You guys remember that guy that got busted and got beat up when he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho? That's not a safe road there. But they said they didn't care. When they heard about Jesus, when they heard from Jesus, their heart moved. There was so much fire, they could not keep it within. Do you want to know if you've really heard about himself, about Jesus or not? Do you want to know if you really have a burning or not? Is what does your lips do? Oh, you know, I keep to myself. No, then you haven't heard him. Because there's a fire that just contains you that you can't do anything. I love Psalm 39. You could read it later, but I love the part where David says, you know, I went and I was like, people were talking bad to me and I was like, ugh, getting angry. Like, you know, have you ever had someone that kind of get under your skin and you're like, oh, you want to like say, give it to them, you know, and say a couple of things that you shouldn't be saying. And so David doesn't want to do that. He has a, he's a man after God's own heart, so... What does he do? He says, that's it. He went like this. He zipped up his lips. He said, I'm just not going to talk. Because I don't want to say something wrong. And he says, and as I went like that, I found that there's godly things that want to come out. And it says, and it burned. It started to burn me. And then I just couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. Sure, I don't want to say anything bad. And sure, that person against me is just like, keeps coming, man. It's just like, they don't stop. 
And I don't want to say anything bad, so I'm trying to be quiet, but being quiet burns me. I can't. I have so much of the Word of God to share. So he says, I just exploded. I started sharing with them about the Word of God. Do you share with anyone about the Word of God? If you do, that's a good sign. Maybe your heart burns. Maybe my heart burns. And maybe we've actually seen him as we read the Word of God. So they rose up that very hour. They couldn't wait and returned to Jerusalem. Another two, three hours, but this one probably took them two or less because they were probably going, they were so excited. They returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together. Everyone was right there, hanging out, saying, so here they, they, they walked in and the, the other people, the 11 and the others were talking. They didn't give them a chance to say anything. Saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon, exclamation mark. Simon exclamation mark. If there was a time that I would love to have been there, that I really, 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 sure, the Bible study I told you, which Bible study I would have loved to be there. But a time where I really would have loved to be there is when he appeared to Simon Peter, because that secret held, zipped up, not allowed for any of us to know what happened in that meeting, that private meeting. There's a public meeting that we know about in the Gospel of John in the last chapter, but this one is a private meeting. That is the one where he healed him. Lord, I want to know, what is it that you said to him? How did you meet him? How did you heal his heart? That would be amazing. The pastor wants to be there with Mary Magdalene. That would be awesome too, but this one, I really want to be there. That would be awesome to be there. He went, and they're like, he appeared. He's risen, and he appeared to Simon. Exclamation mark. And they told about, and then it was their turn to share, about the things that had happened on the road. You guys don't know. We had a whole Bible study. It was awesome. But then we didn't know him. And then what happened is, the, uh, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. But at a common meal is when we got to know and recognize Jesus. Okay, there's no time to read the rest of the chapter. But a couple of things real quickly. Two inappropriate behaviors to the power of his resurrection is to go about our daily business to go about our daily business and do the normal old thing and not pause when he's trying to get our attention and speak to us. But may the Lord help us to pause and let him change us. Second inappropriate thing is to be sad and let everything get to us when the Lord is victorious and he can give us that victory and make us walk in his victory. But the thing I'd like to end with, spend maybe five minutes on it, is seven things that were opened in this chapter. <clears throat> first one, <clears throat> in, in the verse one, it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. The tomb was opened. And that's maybe in the order... That's not the order it happened, some of the things that I'm going to share, but it's the order it's documented, and I, th I feel that God is trying to share this. First thing is that God wants to open is that tomb. He wants to open that tomb. And that tomb could mean many, maybe two things. The tomb could mean is if you don't know him as your savior, you're dead. Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we were dead in our trespasses. Not sick, not have a disease, we were dead. When we don't have Christ, when we are not saved, we are dead. And so that's the thing, the tomb. Has that tomb been opened? And he wants to roll away that tomb because if that has not been opened yet, there's none of the other things that can happen. But maybe we're believers, but we, our tomb is not opened. Maybe we have that great big stone, like it says in Mark, for it was very large. Maybe there's a problem in your life, in my life. Maybe there's a circumstance, a situation, an issue that is so big that we feel it's too big, it just can't roll away. And that is what makes me stand still. That's what makes me not be able to serve my God or live for Him. Sometimes it's a, it's a problem. Sometimes it's a guilt of something that I have done. Sometimes it's whatever it is. It's something big that's in my way that makes me not want to push forward and serve God. God says, I want my first thing that I'd really love to do for you, that I want to do for you. There's some things that 
We're going to see he's opening, and there's some things that we need to open. The first thing that is open is open by him, because salvation is by grace. And also our problems, we can't fix them on our own. But he can intervene in them, in our issues, and whatever it is, our sin, or whatever. He says, I can intervene and set you free and get you out to be open and to start your walk clean again with me if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, I can let you start life with me again. And I don't know what that stone is, but he says, I really want on this Resurrection Sunday to roll away the tomb, death from your life. Or whatever is bringing up a stench in your life and my life. I want to roll it away. I want to take it away and move it very far so that we can go to the next thing to, that would open up. And I pray that whatever it is that we give it to him. I pray that we say, Lord, I, I'm sorry for it. Lord, I brought myself here, but I confess and I want you to intervene. I want you to come and remove and open that tomb for me. The second thing that was open, and right after the Lord does that, there's this other thing that opens. Verse 29, but they constrained him, saying, abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent, and he went in to stay with them. The second thing that's open is our home. Who's opening here? Not him, it's us. That's the second. The first thing is God says, I want to remove whatever is huge in your life that you feel is impossible. I want to remove it. I want to open it. If you are a sinner and you are not saved, I want to remove that from you and I want to save you by my grace. If you're a believer and maybe you've gone so deep, you think you're so deep, you can't come out of your sin or you're such a deep problem that is so big that has made you, quieted you. He says, I'm here to set you free and I want to open it today. I want to open it for you. But after I open it, I expect you to open up voluntarily and actually I want you to be pushy I want you to force me and constrain me to come into your life and allow me that 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 authority in your life the second thing that happened is they opened their home but unless we that rock that tomb has been rolled away has been opened there's not going to be any opening of our home to him so I pray that God will give us will will allow him to take away that tomb to open it that stone and that we would allow him to come in. And right after he comes into our home, you know what happens? Verse 31. Then their eyes were open and they knew him. Lord. You don't just open the tomb, the death in my life and my issues that I got myself into. You don't just get rid of that and you allow even me, measly, miserable me, good for nothing me, to open my home to you, to allow you to come in, but you don't stop there. You also open my eyes. Open my eyes to what? To, that they knew him. You make me know you more. You mean if I know it's you in my life, but now I know you very differently. I know you in a special way, in a very unique way that's only that you reveal yourself in such as, as, as just what a privilege. You know, have you ever read the Bible and you're like, okay, that's awesome. But have you ever read the Bible like, wow, wow. And that's what it talks about here is they open their eyes to him. They knew him. It's not like, you know, Jesus, we know Jesus. If you're a saved but to know him like, wow, Jesus, you're so amazing. Lord, open our eyes to see you in a totally different way. Open my eyes to see you in a whole new level. Open my eyes to see you much deeper than I know you right now. Open my eyes. So here he's the one that opened their eyes after they opened their home. The next thing that he opened with them is verse 32. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. He doesn't just let us see him in a different way, but he let us let's see his scripture in a different way. It becomes interesting. It's not like, oh, it's that time again. What am I going to do? And you're like, oh, you get one of those opening eye things, you know, that the dentist used for the mouth. You put it on your eye, like, okay, I'm going to try to read today. Like, wow. It's like, really, how do you read this stuff? And then you're like, wow. This is amazing scripture. When he opens it, it's different than when we open it. When we open it, we don't see him. We, don't, we see a bunch of words like, ah, what? A bunch of names, whatever. Skip that chapter. Okay, a bunch of sacrifices. We should skip that one too. Can we get to a chapter that we can understand? 
But then, ah, when he opens it to us. He opened the scriptures to us. Lord, help us not open the scriptures anymore. I mean, read the Bible, okay? But but you open it to us. Please, Lord. Lord, you open it to us. It's going to taste so much different. It's going to be so much enjoyable. Lord, we're going to look forward to it. We're actually going to set our alarm early to wake up and just spend that time with you. We're not going to do this whole rush thing, you know, like, oh, whatever. I don't have time to eat. I don't have to do this. But I always have time to put on makeup or do my shower, you know. Really? (laughs) Our priorities, guys. Yeah, we don't skip breakfast too many times. Uh, How am I going to function? Verse 35. The fifth thing. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. When he opens our eyes to him in a special way, when he opens the scriptures in a special way, we start to open our mouth. We can't keep it closed. We start to open our mouth. You know why we don't open our mouth? Because we're not satisfied. And we should probably close our mouth sometimes. Sometimes we share about Jesus and we push people away rather than help them. But oh, when we're satisfied with him, and first he started with him, they saw him. Then it was open to scriptures. Then we're satisfied with his word and seeing him. And this word, this mouth, you can't shut it up. It just keeps talking and talking about him. They started to explain to them. And they opened their mouth. And they told them about the things that had happened on the road. Verse 45. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. When the Lord sees us sharing Our mouth is open and we're sharing because we're satisfied with him and with his word. He's like, you think you've seen me in my word and and the word is special? Oh, wait till I open something else with you. Not only are your eyes open, not only is your mouth open, not only are you seeing scripture in a cool way, but now your understanding is open. Now you see it with a much even deeper depth. It, now you experience Ezekiel as he went in and he's like, whoa, this looks like I can handle this water. He goes in, it's to the heels. Oh, that's good, man. I think I understand the word of God. He goes in a little deeper, it's to the knees. Wait a minute, it's a lot deeper than I thought it was. Yes, it is. Come in a little bit more, a thousand more foot or, or cubits or whatever. He goes in and he's like, oh, it's to the hip, but I still don't think I got a handle on this. He's like, come in a little bit more. And he's like, wait a minute, this is a sea that cannot be crossed. His word word is so deep his word is so amazing and then you feel it's called the opening the understanding and then you feel so small next to this amazing word and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures the last thing that he opened for them is verse 51 now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven if he goes into heaven what happens to heaven it opens up he opened heaven to us, oh Jesus, oh resurrected Jesus, come and open these things. Let us open the two things that are on our end, but you come and open the other five. Let us experience these seven openings in our lives. Lord, I put the tomb in my life before you. Lord, I sit in front of my tomb perplexed, confused, don't know what to do about it, but Lord, you can open it. You can open it and it's so simple for you. Let me not make it complex. Sure, it's complex. Sure, it's difficult. But you, you simplify it. You open it up. And Lord, take that away from me so that then I can open my home to you and tell you, Lord, you are welcome in my home. You are actually king in my home. You stand, you sit on the throne in my home. You call the shots in my home. And then when we give him that, he comes and he opens our eyes to see him totally differently. We get satisfied with him. 
and seeing Him. Then He opens our, 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 the Scriptures to us, the Word of God to us. And then we start seeing Him just coming everywhere from every direction at us through His Word, and we're satisfied through His Word. Then we are so satisfied that our mouth starts to open up, and we start sharing with others about Him and His Scripture, and people start changing because they see the change in us. And so we open our lips, and then we, He opens our understanding even more to know Him even deeper and deeper and deeper. And He says, time to come home. And He opens heaven to us and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful in what is little. I will put you over much. I pray in this resurrection that we experience these seven openings and that we say, Lord, thank you that heaven is open. I like that song. It says, heaven is calling out to me. My soul longs for the city of peace. Heaven is calling out to me. Heaven is open. And he's open. His heart is open. He's actually seated us with him in the heavenlies. Lord, help me not be inappropriate. Help me not just go about my daily business when you want to open seven things in my life. Lord, help me not be inappropriate and be sad when you want to open seven things that includes my lips and includes my home. Lord, help me. Help me burn within when I see you, when I hear you. And it doesn't have to be something extravagant in my eyes because you being in my life, that's extravagant. Lord, your love is extravagant. Lord, you're amazing. Lord, I just, I just want to sit at your feet and just drink from that cup in your hand. Lord, I, you're, I don't know what to say, Lord, except that I want the power of your resurrection on this Resurrection Sunday. Not something I heard, but something that I experience from now on as I live with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross. We thank you that that is your demonstration of your love for us. And Jesus, we thank you for your demonstration of your love for us, that you willingly died and that you resurrected and resurrected us with you. We pray that the power of the resurrection would be something we would experience that we would not be ones that would be asked the question, why, what are you speaking about so sad, standing there so sad? But help us be rejoicing by the power of your resurrection. Lord, help us not leave where you want us to be for where we want to be like they did to go to Emmaus. But we thank you even if we do, you approach us and then you restore us and you bring us back to Jerusalem, Lord to our Jerusalem, Lord. Lord, I pray that if we are foolish and maybe we're not aware, or our hearts are slow and we're not aware, that you would, that you would come with your word, come with your presence, and let us burn by hearing you talk and opening scripture. Lord, open up these seven things in our lives. Pray for fruit for these words in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, collect the, the offering as, as the worship team is coming up. Hallelujah. <clears throat>